It is an undeniable observation of human behaviour that we as humans are selfish and self-interested creatures. We see this in the smallest two-year-old who demands that the world revolves around them. When it appears in a 30-year-old is the same mindset that will stab you in the back to advance their own career or destroy a marriage for their own self-fulfillment. When you set yourself up on a ladder like that, what you're saying is, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk at you. And we live in a world where people don't agree with that kind of behavior. We have got to become a missionary church. And a missionary church is one that is intelligent to the culture that it's witnessing to. I know, I know. He's making stuff up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Who's this? Mr. Rax TV. What, sorry? Mr. Rax TV. Mr. Rax TV. Why is that Who are Mr. Is this? Is this? Forgive me, I'm not, I'm not using this pejoratively, but I'm just trying to use this as a moniker to recognise you. Are you the one that they call Rat Boy? No. Oh. no but that's the but that's the land. I, 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 I wasn't using that pejoratively. I, I just don't, I don't recognise you. I don't know. I don't know. Why well, he's got shades on? I'm handsome boy. <laughs> hey, hey, bro. How are we doing? So I am going to do a talk if you're interested. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of different things actually. Um, and then we'll take it from there. Today, if I can get through everything I want to get through, I want to do two talks, and then I want to have a debate about this um, Islamic Injil, this so-called Islamic Injil. So we need to find someone who wants to talk about it. But to... Uh, message to who? Mohammed who? Prophet Mohammed. Well, I, I want to talk about the, the so-called Islamic Injil that... that that has been spoken about but I, but I, before I get on to that I want to talk about two other things um, so very briefly if I if I could maybe stand with my back at that fence just because it feels safer we move away from this brother if he's gonna preach well done bros so I want to give a talk about um, about apologetics and polemics and why they're needed in the church. Currently within the church there is almost an aversion to having dispute with the world, to having dispute with Islam, to having dispute with communism. Um, and this is coming from an effeminized spirituality that has become the characterization of the Western church. And I want to ask whether that spirituality that says we can't have argument, we can't make argument against false ideologies and belief systems, such as communism, Islam and Nazism, is, is actually scriptural. It's actually scriptural. The number of Christians that I have met who are fearful or who do not wish to get involved in dispute is alarming compared to those that are. And it is very much a problem because it is not being preached from the pulpit about the need for two things, apologetics and polemics. And I'm going to demonstrate now why these two things are scriptural. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, we read, as Paul writes, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive 
to the obedience of Christ. The scriptures here, Peter is saying that we, the apostles, are destroying speculations. The kind of speculations that he was talking about were the kind of things that he talks about in his letter to Timothy, about people coming up with speculations about endless genealogies, or about those who speculated about the idea that the day of the Lord had already come and that the resurrection was not a physical resurrection. How do you think that they were destroying them except by disputation, Expect, except by making argumentation based upon an authority and a belief system and constructing arguments from that belief system that opposes belief systems that set themselves up in opposition to the gospel. Clearly, this is what the apostles were doing. This is what we call a po uh, polemics. Polemics are those things where you construct an argument exposing the fallacies of the alternative ideology. So to give an example of this, Christians believe that all human beings are born in sin, that our nature is corrupt, that it turns away from God and from what is good and turns towards that which is selfish and self-concerned. This is observable within our world. We see it all the time. Communism, by contrast, and Islam both believe that human nature is inherently neutral, that is simply written upon by society, and whatever society writes upon the character of the person will define how that person behaves. So a polemic in this instance would be to demonstrate the fallacy that human beings are not inherently sinful by pointing to the fact that no matter what ideology you have, what belief system you have, it is an undeniable observation of human behavior that we as humans are selfish and self-interested creatures. We see this in the smallest two-year-old who demands that the world revolves around them. Now, when a two-year-old does it, it's completely harmless. The social effects are minimal. It hurts no one. It's, al it's almost entertaining and often very is. But that same, that same mindset, when it appears in a 30-year-old, is the same mindset that will stab you in the back to advance their own career or destroy a marriage for their own self-fulfillment. That's an example of polemic. But the scriptures also teach that we must be able to use what is called apologetics. Now, an apologetic is a defense of your belief. So, for example, we Christians believe that Jesus Christ was crucified 2,000 years ago. And we can defend this belief by appealing to early historians, Roman historians who are not Christian and had no interest in the Christian faith, who testify to the fact that the crucifixion really occurred. And we can also appeal to the writings of the Church Fathers who are independent witnesses to the Gospels of the fact of the crucifixion. And we can also appeal to New Testament literature, such as the writings of Luke, the writings of John, the writings of Paul, and the writings of Mark, who were written independently of one another. 
testifying to the fact of the crucifixion. And so we see that the crucifixion is a well-attested fact in history. This is an example of an apologetic. Ideologies like Islam, who deny this crucifixion, are arguing against history and against the evidence of history. And this kind of argumentation is justified in the scripture when the Apostle Peter said, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense. That word defense is the word apologia, from which we get the word apologetic to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes in 10 verse 5, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So the use of apologetic and polemic, far from being anti-Christian, far from being in line with a spirit of Christian faith, is inherent within the apostolic teachings. And I would urge every Christian to urge their fellowship to begin studying apologetics and polemics and to teach the faith apologetically and polemically so that our youth and our communities can defend the faith that we have first given by the apostles to their successors. Thank you. I've got a question, it's not related to today, is that okay? It's to, yeah. yeah um, so I think it was last week or the week before you were talking about uh, Christians um, being in the community, a community in the community. Yeah. yeah. So um, you were talking about how Christians should be um, set up Christian companies, work for Christian companies, work for Christian organisations, and follow their time with Christian organisations, network with Christian businesses support Christian charities, establish Christian political parties and work for the advancement of the kingdom through establishing other organisations that perhaps yet meet a need that has not yet been met within the body of Christ such as dating agencies and so on. Um, I know Christians have set up companies and obviously Christians work for those companies by like I imagine the majority of Christians work for a, a secular yeah. company. And would you say that's not a good thing for the Christian? Would you I, say I would say that if you're, I would say that in the spirit of charity, by, by setting up that kind of network, we can offer an exa uh, 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 a alternative society to the world. But the only way we can do that successfully is if that is rooted in a strong Christian identity. A clear Christian identity, one that's connected to our own sense of history. I hope that answers your question. What's your name, brother? Uh, Kesh. Kesh, are you a Christian? Kesh. I am. Yeah. Kesh, where are you? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I've been uh, sort of looking at sort of the Soko stuff for yeah. a while. It's really good, really encouraged. I, I don't live in London either, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I had, a, I had a day away from the family today, so I thought I'd come down here. So right. I'm glad I. I caught you and caught some of the other Christians doing good stuff here. It's really interesting actually because um, the um, cowboy preacher there, he had a big crowd and it's quite clear because there's a lot of Christians that say actually street preaching doesn't work out. Well, I think it does. I, I would think. disagree. I think that when you set yourself up on a ladder like that, yeah. what you're saying is I don't want to talk to you. Yeah. I want to talk at you. Yeah. And we live in a world where people don't agree with that kind of behavior. It still attracts people though. It yeah. attracts yeah. people, but yeah. is it attracting people for the right reasons? Well, yeah. Yeah. Are we putting people off yeah. by not adapting ourselves to the consumerist culture that we live in? And, and by thinking that we can preach to people 
and, and, and that that is effective. Because I suspect that most of the people in that crowd were actually against what he was standing for. Yeah, that's probably quite a lot of that to be. And, and, yeah. and the reason, and, and like, one of the reasons why you don't see many Muslim speakers on ladders is because they've recognised what I'm talking about. Yeah. That you've got to engage people and, and, and dispute and discuss with them if you want to have any kind of success with them. The church needs to change its model of evangelism rather than standing on a street corner like a lonely preacher with your Bible screaming and shouting at everyone, which very few people have the talent to do, though I accept some people definitely do have that talent. We need to uh, adapt our way of evangelism to the culture. So it would be better to organize groups of Christians, to set up tables, to buy decent literature, not cheap, horrible pamphlets, but really good written literature, literature. engage people one-to-one, -one. and engage people with our culture, with our history, with our values, with our beliefs. And that's got to be rooted in a church that has the capacity to welcome people in without compromising anything of its own identity. Whereas at the moment, evangelism is largely left to eccentrics who stand on street corners armed solely with a dogmatic belief that the word of God will not return empty, who then scream and shout at people who are just walking past them and then they have a gut reaction that says crazy Christians. Just wake up church. We don't send missionaries to the Muslim world and expect them to behave like that. Why do we expect them to behave like that here in the UK? We have got to become a missionary church. And a missionary church is one that is intelligent to the culture that it's witnessing to. Anyway, I want to debate a guy called Rajiv over there. So, peace be with you. A very quick question, yes? Yeah, sure, I'm Ben. Um, I've heard you speak on um, variations in Quranic texts before. Yeah. Um, do those variations amount to any um, significant theological difference? No. They don't? No. They're, they're, they, they don't in terms of every single doctrine except one. Which is the idea that the Quran has not been influenced by the process of human history and transcription. So, so Muslims have it as a matter of doctrine that their text has been perfectly preserved, has never been revised, has never been changed, has never been altered. But the evidence demonstrates the contrary. So it affects that one doctrine. But those changes, when analysed, don't affect any other doctrine. But they do affect the idea of a, a perfectly preserved text that has never had the influence of human hand upon it. Which is a significant point of view. Yes. But, but, but ultimately, there's, there's other, other textual forms of criticism that are quite destructive to the Quran. So there's clear evidence that the Quran has borrowed from other texts. So the, the, the Arab infancy gospel and that idea about um, a, a baby Christ um, blowing life into birds is a text clearly taken from Arab infancy gospels. The story of Solomon and the idea that he sends out a bird who discovers the Queen of Sheba, who comes back, um, seems to have attracted a wasp. Um, they, these kinds of they, that that story is borrowed from a much earlier Jewish text. The Gospel of Thomas in there as well. Is there some reference to the Gospel of Thomas? Uh, possibly, I'm not sure. But what what? But the thing is, the Muslims argue that the these texts were translated into Arabic much later, forgetting for a fact, forgetting that in the seventh century education was oral, not written. So the fact that Muhammad was a traveller and a trader and he went into Syria and he lived in Medina amongst the Jews, he would have been exposed to those traditions, he would have absorbed them orally, and then he goes to Mecca, where these stories may not have been heard by the locals, introduces them to them. But if you read carefully the Quran, the Quran says that the pagan believers in Mecca accused Muhammad of plagiarism. Why? Because they'd heard the stories. Because they'd heard these stories themselves. So some of these stories were not new. 
And last he was rejected also as a prophet amongst the, amongst the Arabian Jews. He, he was rejected amongst the Arabian Jews and amongst the majority of Meccans. But that's not an argument. Um, because Christ was rejected by the majority of Jews. Most prophets were rejected. But I wonder what the rationale behind that rejection was. Well, it's because he didn't fall in line with the idea of the prophetic following of uh, uh, one who preaches in the name of Yahweh. But that is not an argument. And it's not an argument because Jesus was rejected by most Jews. So we don't make, you shouldn't make weak arguments. Don't clutch at straws. What you've got to do is you've got to find solid arguments. And one of the solid arguments that we have, of many, is the fact that when you look at form criticism and textual criticism of the Quran. Sorry, what is form criticism? The idiot's guide to what form criticism? It's when you look at the form of the text, the genere of the text, you see what that text is saying and you, you look at what the origins of that, that, that particular genere is in terms of its communication. So the story about um, the, the story that is given about Solomon is given as a moral tale. And it's given as a moral tale in its Jewish origin as well. But the fact that those two stories match so well indicates that Muhammad is borrowing yeah. from other sources. Good. Thanks for All right. Okay. God bless, brother. Are you a Christian? Great.